Um, this is our final, um, our final Q and A here in this room, actually on the ship. So I hope you had a chance to see the others. Did you guys enjoy the question and answers? And it's our final one on board the Flower Power Cruise, and today it's called Being in a Band. And uh, we're going to be happy to be joined by three stars of uh, number one hit making bands of the 60s, the Monkees, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and the Buckinghams. So you're going to find out uh, what it's like to try to get four, five, or ten guys to agree on one thing in a band. We know that was difficult in some of these bands that uh, we've come to know over the years. How their egos, their personalities sometimes get in the way. And how years later, uh, many of them are forgiving and they reunite and they do these tours and these great cruises and events and concerts and they kind of look back on those days with love so in fondness, so we'll find out. So let's bring out our guests. Our uh, first is a number one band from the Windy City. They scored their first number one hit in 1966, Kind of a Drag, which I used to call Canada Dry. <laughs> You can do it, you can sing along wrong to that one, but Kind of a Drag was a huge number one. They produced four more top 20 hits in 67, Don't You Care, Mercy, 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 Hey Baby, They're Playing Our Song, and The Psychedelic Susan. 1967, Billboard named them the most listened to band in America. We remember them from the Ed Sullivan Show, the uh, Jerry Lewis Show, the um, Smothers Brothers, the Joey Bishop Show, and American Bands. And making their second appearance on the Flower Power Cruise, please welcome Carl G. Marisi and Nick Fortuna of the Buckingham. Looking buff, Carl, looking buff there, Nick. Spending time in the gym, keeping yourself looking good to get out there and do these meeting grades. Uh, it's Electric, yeah, that's a great song. No, Electric hello. Lady Land. There they are. Hello, hello. These guys put on a couple of great shows for us. All right, former lead singer and hit maker, Paul Revere and the Raiders, star of Where the Action Is. Their hits included, of course, Kicks, Good Thing, What's It Gonna Be Him or Me, Hungry, Indian Reservation, Arizona, fresh from last night's 50 Summers of Love with Mickey Dolans. Please welcome Mark Lindsay. What an entertainer. Hello. All right, you know the Monkees had uh, 12 top 40 hits, including three number ones, five platinum albums, and a hit TV show, and a movie. And as we heard last night, uh, the 50 Summers of Love show, uh, they were the number one selling act of 1967. Isn't that amazing? The Monkees yeah. were. When you had Sgt. Pepper and all these other bands. Please welcome singer, songwriter, actor, director, radio personality, theater director, and of course, lead singer of the Monkees, Mickey Dolenz. Time, Mickey is here for his third Flower Power Cruise in a row, and he's so popular and so awesome. And thank you, my friend. Thanks for coming back. Appreciate it. Everybody feeling good? You guys up here? All right. Just to let you know, when we finish, we're going to usher the guys out the way we, they came in because we have an autograph signing outside the back door. But Mickey has an event at three, so we're going to try to make it as quick as we can so that we don't have uh, everybody waiting around or somebody being late. So we're going to have a great time. So we'll just do that after rather than rushing the stage. So, But take as many photos as you want during the event. So, uh, Mickey, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what can go wrong in a band? <laughs> Nothing. No? I've never been in a band where anything went wrong, did you? No. <laughs> Everybody's just, ah, everything is beautiful. Well, you know, the, um, the thing that happens in a band, especially in like more classic configurations, it's usually ki uh, people you grew up with or your siblings, uh, you know, uh, literally, you know. Uh, and there's this thing called sibling rivalry. <laughs> and <clears throat> when you grow up with people and you spend an enormous amount of time, not just uh, the playing part, which is kind of the easy part, the, that's why they call it playing, <laughs> um, but the other stuff, the business, the travel, the, you know, and that can get on, on, on your nerves uh, with people in a band or people in a relationship, in a marriage, and when you're like locked in to, to, to other people, whether you like it or not, it's like, it's forced. I mean, you have to be there. You have to be, you can't just walk away and say, ah, screw you, I'm gonna, you know. You can't do that. You're forced into 
these very intimate, powerful, successful, uh, and sometimes not successful. And then there's the element of creativity because our business, our cargo is selling emotion in all the entertainment industry, in music and films and television, whatever it is, you're selling emotion. You're selling something that, that speaks to people uh, uh, of the human condition, of love, of hate, of jealousy, of whatever. And those get very personal and that, that can, uh, you know, create creative tension on top of that. And not to say that all other industries aren't just as important, but if you're, say, uh, uh, a vacuum cleaner salesman, that's great. And you got your vacuum and you got your things and your invoice. In our business, you're not only the vacuum cleaner salesman, you're the vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> and that can and that can create very hello, hello. well create uh, difficult uh, s uh, scenarios. Mark, is your mic on, Mike? Mark, no, it isn't. Mark, can we get a mic for Mark? A mark for Mike? One, two, well, you oh. know, two, one, two, one, two. You know there it is. I, I, I just wanted to say one thing about Mickey. You were vacuum cleaners. Do we suck? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I couldn't resist, man. You set me up. Oh my God. Sorry, what did you say, Joe? Tom, I was going to say, Tom Carl's going to say. Oh. I was going to say, when you asked if bands get along, uh, and Nick will remember this, we, we used to tour with this band, the Easy Beats. Remember they had yeah. one hit Friday night? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they got their aggressions. They used to beat each other up. They actually, <laughs> really? They, they, they would. Yeah. Green Act. Yeah, look at that. They were always fighting. That certainly happened to the yeah. Eagles, if you guys saw that, that special. Yeah. Where, the way they were like, you could hear them cursing at each other. Or so. Oasis, Nolan. Uh, 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 huh? Yeah. Liam. Sorry. Nolan yeah. Liam. I mean, you know, it can, it can. The Everly Brothers. Look at that. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I was there when uh, the guitar was smashed at, at uh, Jane John Wayne Theater. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So that's the what answer to your question. So Mark, uh, let me ask you, as a yes. guy that was in a band with multiple members, is, is it important to have a leader of the band, or in the case of the Monkees, where, where maybe it was spread more even, because you were... Well, there was four leaders. <laughs> there were four leaders, okay. It, 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 it is in our band, I was handling the music, and Paul was handling the business, so we kind of had two leaders going in different directions. But I've got to jump in here, and you were talking about dynamics within the band, and how a band evolves, and whatever. Uh, I'll give you two little quick things. Um, the band started in Idaho and then broke up or was on a hiatus for two years while Paul Revere uh, fulfilled his Uncle Sam thing. And he was a conscious objector, so he had to work in a mental hospital for two years. Not as a patient, but, <laughs> but as a cook. But anyway, while well, he went and he said, well, the band's over, man, that's it. I said, no, no, I'm going to go to California. I'll keep the band alive. I'll keep on the record guy. So they, we, we had kind of a hit. We had a chart hit with like long hair. And the record uh, the guy that owned the record company said, you guys got to go on tour. And I said, we can. We had to have Paul Revere. So finally, we decided to go out as Paul Revere's Raiders with Paul's blessing. And the band that we put together, the piano player was Leon Russell. He was this new kid, new kid in town. It was going to be Bruce Johnston. And at the very last day, he didn't show up for rehearsal. I went out and found him on a surfboard in Sunset Beach. He said, oh man, I decided not to do it. You know, he's like, we're in California. So one night I said, we get, gotta get a piano player. So they suggested Leon Russell. So we take off, we go to Kansas. Nobody in Kansas has heard of Paul Revere and the Raiders. I mean, we were in Idaho, we're a Northwest fan. You know, we were happening in the Northwest, but in Kansas, I go out there and I look at this skinny kid and I'm, I'm out there and I'm with these really talented musicians and I'm just freaked, man. So um, nothing's happening. We come back after the first, first set. I go, shoot, man, this is a rough crowd. I mean, I'm not getting to them. And Leon says, look, kid, just kick it to me. When you get back, give me like 10 minutes so I'll, I'll set you up. So get back on stage. Leon, there's, Leon's playing an upright piano. He gets behind it, and, he, and he, he kicks the top of the piano off, and goes whoosh, 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 lands in the crowd, he says, hey, you guys want a freaking rock and roll or what? And the crowd goes, oh, yeah. 
And so, and then he gave a, like about a 10 minute uh, uh, course in Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was amazed. So I, I, I learned at the feet of the master for those two weeks. We got back to Idaho. We started the band again. I said, Revere, it's not good enough for us just to be, you know, stand there and play instruments. We have to do something. So one of our first shows was a frat, a frat dance at the, at the college, the University of Oregon. And we show up, and these guys, these, you know, these brothers are standing around, they're going, well, who are you guys? We said, well, Paul Revere He said, huh, we could have had Doug Clark and the Hot Nuts. <laughs> and I said, I said, what's so good about Doug Clark and the Hot Nuts? They say, they play in their underwear. I said, okay guys, pants off. And, and, and that started the whole tenor of the band, and that's when I realized I, I made it my mission to get crazier every show. I had a 100-foot cord made by microphone so I could go into the men's room when I had to, <laughs> and while singing Fever. And, and it just changed, you know, I mean, those little, those little break points. But, you, you know, if you, you watch other bands and you learn, you know? I learned a lot from these guys. <laughs> I just, I just learned a lot from you. <laughs> too much, a little too much, Nick? Nick? TMI there? You're not going to take off your pants, no, man. No, no. I not not till the show tonight. Not till the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with the Buckinghams, when you guys were be beginning, uh, how is it that, how do you make a tough decision? Or you have to ask somebody to leave the band or something? That's part of being in a band, and if you're no, the guy... Well, I mean, I don't know about back then, because that was a long time ago, 50 years, right? Sure. But today, Carl does all the nice things, I do the ugly stuff. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Anything, anything that has to be negative done in the band, it's up That's you. Yeah, it's, I do that. That's why you're in the gym all the time. Yeah. So you can take uh, back in the day, though... It, this it isn't uh, real, this is silicon. Yeah. <laughs> It, it was a democracy. I, he told me it's, it's silicon implants. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I wake up in the morning and I have this little hole in the beginning of my toe and I plug it into this. <laughs> pumps them up. It works. But, but we were pretty much a democracy back in the day. You know, we would, you know, we, we all got along pretty good, I think, and we would, you know, collectively make decisions and and whatever, and then so, uh, we accept when we got a when we got a manager. Then, it, then well, we then he made all the you know yeah, he made all the stupid decisions. Yeah. <laughs> but you would uh, if if somebody brought a song to the group oh, and yeah. like one person loved it, the guy that wrote it, they were, brought it in and made the other five yeah, guys. Well, I think we all would have to really yeah, like I the mean, song well, and get the, behind the, it. The first know? four hits that we had was were, were brought in on one tape. You know, Jimmy Holtz. Brought, yeah, know, this our manager, our manager brought in and said, uh, well, you know, listen to these songs. I, this, we think this is really, really good for, you know, for the for the Buckinghams. Uh, and there were he had a, a band called Jimmy Ford and the Ambassadors. He was playing it at the time, and then they became the Mob. I don't know if you guys had ever heard that band. It was a big, big band in Chicago, and then they moved to Vegas. Blah blah blah, whatever. No, they're but, from New York. Okay. Anyway, so uh, he had these four songs, and you know. Carl and myself and the other guys in the band listened to him. Didn't sound anything like the way we recorded kind of it. Drag them. or Don't You Care or Susan or Hey Baby sounds, you know, the way we did them. But he did it with an acoustic guitar and he wasn't really much of a singer. But, um, you know, we You could tell the songs were there. We, yeah, the songs were there. Actually, the first song, kind of a drag, our, our manager at the time, this guy Carl Bonafetti, he was trying to find us an original tune and he got this Jim Holvey, the songwriter from the mob. He went to his house with a reel-to-reel -reel tape player and a microphone, and he, he was just strumming on the guitar, and he played the song, you know, on the on the tape. He made a tape of it and brought it back to us, and we said, "It's a cool tune," you know. And we rehearsed it, and someone's made, you know, we used to rehearse in in basements. So not in a million years that I would think kind of a drag was to be number one. Not, I never. That was the last song that we had on USA Records. It was our last release, and after that song, we were going to be off the label, and. That was the last one out, and we had about, about, about three or four regional hits, you know, in the Midwest. And then the last song that came out, of course, was kind of a drag, and I went, uh oh, here comes the stiff. You know, this one's gonna, this is not gonna make it. And, all of a and it was a number one record that uh, I mentioned on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome Knock the monkeys on the believer off the number one song. <laughs> uh, 
you know, oh, I'm sorry, Nick, but uh, the, the bands up until then really didn't put horn sections on. You guys came before Chicago and Blood Sweat. Yeah, so that, that's, the whole, that's a whole other story because um, the Chicago. We went, in, we went into the studio and our manager. Well, we actually we were tied into uh, another guy named Dan Bellick who was involved with our. He was band producing. Also. He was us. producing us. And when we went into the studio to do these songs, he walked in with these three horn players that were from. His band, he was actually a, a music, he was a, a musician and he had his own band, so he brought these three horn players in. And so we're going, who the hell are these guys, man, you know? So they walked in and, and it was, you know, they did the horn tracks on it and then after that, we, you know. So then you yeah, signed we, over the horn tracks. We were a cover yeah, band. He knew the charts, really. the guy that brought him in. Yeah. yeah, he brought, you know, he had a big band. He had, it was his idea that, hey, let's put horns to these songs. Because we were a five-piece band that was playing around Chicago. But did mostly. you think that you didn't like that idea at first? No, it, it, we, well, I thought it was cool. You know? it, it, it dressed up the songs. Yeah. It, it was. It went along really well with, you know, and that intro on kind of a drag is what just grabbed you right away, you know, with that horn, the horn yeah. intro. And so, and then after that happened, then we yeah. moved to New York and we started recording for CBS, yes. Columbia Records. And then, you know, the, the guys that were walking in the studio were all the horn players from The Tonight Show. <laughs> Big difference, yeah. So, but we have our own horn. We actually, we actually, we actually have um, four or five different horn sections. And when we go to different parts of the country, of course, we you know we carry different horn players. But the next time, hopefully, we're on this boat. We'll bring the horn. We're gonna bring our horn section. Yeah, sure. yeah, we actually we were good friends with. Uh, you know, in 67, when things were really happening for us, we'd come back to Chicago and go down to the, uh, to State Street, a lot of clubs down there, and listen to different bands. And there was one group playing there all the time, a group called The Big Thing. And uh, we loved these guys. They were really great. And we kept trying to get our manager to come in and hear these guys. He said, you got to sign them. They're just really good. Well, eventually, he finally listened to us, and he came in, signed them, Chicago. Was in the band then? No, he was, he was our manager. Oh, yeah, he Gersio, was our manager. Yeah, he, Jim Garcia. He made, he made sure that he took all the Buckingham's money to finance their sessions. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Jim Garcia was the Raiders bass player for two weeks. Yeah. There you yeah, go. He was a bass player. In any case, in Vegas, I'm walking by. I went to see Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which is another great horn oh. band. And, uh, and I was walking by the front of the stage when the, when the show was over, and the guitar player said, Don't I know you from someplace? I go, I don't know. He goes, no, you're, you're, you're a musician. I go, yeah. He said, who, who do you play for? I said, I'm the bass player for the Bucky Games. He goes, stop, stay here, don't move. You know? So I'm standing in front of the stage I was with a couple people. He went backstage. He got like six or seven of the uh, musicians that were, you know, all of the guys in Blood, Sweat, and Tears are new guys. Now they're younger, younger, great musicians, but younger guys. Then he goes, this guy, his band is in, his, responsible for Blood, Sweat, and Tears being assembled. Wow. Two story. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, Al Cooper, who started uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, got the idea from our album, uh, Time and Charges, the first Columbia yeah, yeah. record we did. So that was, you know, it's a nice that's tribute. That's a huge compliment for us. So, but anyway, just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> hey, it's a QA, man. Tell us what the dynamic was when they would bring a song into the monkeys to to, vo to voice to voice Yeah, sure. But it must be said, you know, the monkeys, uh, the genetics, uh, if you will, the Darwinian evolution was very, very different from from what you would call a a classic uh, rock and roll band. Um, we'd all been well, not David. David been on Broadway, but Mike and Peter and I had been in bands. Mine was Mickey and the One Nighters. Yeah, baby. Because it was one night, but it was really good. Uh, Peter had been in folk groups with the with some of the Mamas and Papas, and Mike had been in in country folk rock things. And yeah, uh, but the Monkees, as as you all know, uh, didn't start as a, as a uh, you know, an organic kind of growing up in high school together and and playing. We were cast. Uh, into a television show about a rock and roll group. Uh, certainly that's the way that I looked at it, and that was the truth. There was this TV show, a pilot, that year, 65, and uh, there was a script, I still have it, and uh, there's four characters named Billy, Barf, Bongo, and Jimmy, and, 
<coughs> and the producers cast four, uh, four guys um, into these parts, but clearly with musical uh, intention, because you had to be able to sing a song and play an instrument to be in this, what I've always thought of as this little half hour Broadway musical, Marx Brothers musical on television. Much the same way that Glee was a show about an imaginary Glee club. But they could all do it. They could all act and sing and dance and play. There was a lot of auto-tune on that show, though. And there well, was, we didn't well, have it back. The we didn't have it back. Like you had to really be able to sing. <laughs> yeah, we had to be able to sing because you couldn't go, mm -hmm. Now you can. You, you, you had great. to actually, of course, sing. My audition piece, as I've said many times, was Johnny Be Good on the guitar because I was a guitar player. So anyway, so they introduced us one day together after all the screen tests and said, you guys are the monkeys. And so we started out from square one at 21, 22, 23 years old. And it was just, oh, hi, Mike. I'm Mickey P. Oh, I remember you from the audition. Nice to meet you. And the whole thing was constructed and controlled by Screen Gems uh, TV. Uh, Jackie Cooper was running it at the time. And then, no, coinc no coincidence that the music publishing company was Green Gems Publishing Music, which was the Brill Building, which was Donnie Kirshner, Carol King, Boyce and Hart, Neil Sadat. Ergo, a lot of Neil. great songs came right. your way. So a lot of great songs came your way from the Brill Building. Absolutely. If you watched or ever saw Beautiful, the Car yeah. Carol King musical, they even mentioned oh, it at the time in the show. We got to write some songs for this stupid TV show or something. <laughs> So, songs came to us in a very different way, and came to me, and I can only speak personally for myself. Uh, Mike, as we all know, got very frustrated because they had told him, oh yeah, we're gonna use your songs, and yeah. <laughs> he tells the story and, uh, that he went in and he played this new song in the very early days uh, mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the show and the recording, and somebody, the producers, Donnie Kirshner or Boyce and whoever said, Eh, it's not a monkey song. And he said, but I am one of the monkeys. <laughs> and and then, yeah, thank you very much, but no thank you, we'll call you, but that's not wow. a song. So he, he said, oh, okay. And he told me this story. He went to this young girl singer kicking around Los Angeles named Linda Ronstadt, and that was a different drum. And he gave different drums to the Stone Times. And, uh, so the, the way that songs were introduced, like, I remember meeting the songwriters, uh, kind of officially, in this little uh, apartment building, uh, in, it was the Lou Adler of, of Brill Building West, you know. Right, there. on Sunset. Yeah, on Sunset, yeah. And uh, uh, Lester Sill, the published guy, said, you should meet the songwriters. This is after I got the part, we we're filming, we we're recording. And I said, yeah, cool. Uh, you know, I'm 20 or 21 years old. And we walked down this little hallway, and he knocks on the door, and he, Hi, uh, oh hi, Mickey, this is Carol King. She's gonna be writing songs for you. I'm like, oh hi, Carol, how are you? And she's at a little piano and then down the hall and, and oh, David Gates, hi, this is Mickey Dolans. He's on this new show, He's, you're gonna be writing songs for him. So when they submitted a song to me, I mean, I had a gut reaction. Some things I was like, wow, that's, I don't even remember specifically, but they were more like assignments. And I was like, wow, that's a good, because you know, Carol and Neil and, and David, yeah, they didn't write a lot of duff tunes. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, but I, they said, this is gonna be, you're gonna sing this, here's the key, let's routine it, and I'd show up in the studio and, and sing the song. So it, in the early days, it was a very, very different, you know, kettle of fish than it was with, 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 with like you guys, or where people would come yeah, in, or somebody from the band would whole come, different thing, yeah. whole different thing. Yeah. But in case of the monkeys, then it, uh, as you know, we had the Palace Revolt, and then uh, and then uh, we did that wonderful album. I still think it's one of the best called Headquarters. Game of Thrones. And we did everything. <laughs> Catering, he drove the trucks. <laughs> Just like a real band? Vacuumed up. <laughs> but you gotta admit, that, and, and I was reminded last night watching your 50 Summers of Love show, how much I loved the music videos 
because you played last Friday in Clarksville and the whole scene and the fight yeah. scene and everything. And it was, you know, there it was really truly pretty much the first music video. I mean, there were a couple of things before that, but that really was. And you guys in fast motion and everything. That's what set that show apart. I it's mean, dangerous to, to came to claim paternity in these in these yeah, ca cases. True. But yeah, I think that looking back, yeah, the monkeys were. Uh, and the show were the, probably the first to really capitalize on it, to really, uh, you know, use it as a marketing tool. Uh, it, there had been some crossover in the past, but to really use it as a cons as a concerted assault on the consumer, <laughs> that was probably yeah one. Precursor of the to MTV. Sorry. Precursor to MTV. Oh yeah, by years. For sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So, and, and we talked about uh, having a band where you guys make decisions for everybody or everybody agrees. Carl, um, I, I have to, and maybe you, you've talked about this before, but on the song Susan, where it breaks and it goes into that psychedelic oh part. So tell me how that came to be, because it doesn't sound like something you would have thought of. Well, actually, you, it you wasn't. Really was <laughs> doesn't seem like something I would do. Right? Well, it, it didn't fit with the, the texture of well, the Well, what presents. happened was, you know, we uh, after kind of a drag, we recorded that at the old chess studios in Chicago, you know. Uh, great blues studio, you know. It, it, and after that, everything was recorded in New York. You know, we were with Columbia, we signed with Columbia Records, and we were, you know, we would take time. In 1967, we were on the road. We did 300 dates that year. I mean, we were, and we would, we would take a break and go back in the studio and record. So we recorded actually the tracks for Susan and Hey Baby, they're playing our song at the same time. So when we did Susan, we did the basic tracks, which is, you know, the piano and guitars and vocals and, and everything. And, and our producer, Jim Gersio, there was like so many bars of click track in there. It was like nothing, dead air. Oh, you, you left know? the space. Yeah, like they we left the big life. space in the song, yeah, you know, like after like the, the bridge. Point. And then it, it just, uh, you know, cut right there, and then we, and then he had us do the ending, where it's, you know, the I love you, yes I do, and yeah, the love, yeah. love, love uh, part, yes I, yeah. So um, we said to him, well, what are you doing here? I mean, what's, what's going to go in this? And he says, just don't worry, I got this idea. You guys are going to love it. I got this great idea. Okay, so we went back on the road, back touring, you know, and we were in up at about a week or two weeks later, we were up in upstate New York playing a date, and he sent us, in those days, you would get a test pressing of the song, the acetate, to hear with, all mixed and all complete and finished. So we went to a, a person of, that we knew, their house, and we put the acetate, the record, on the record player, and... Record player, man. And we, we thought, we thought it sounded great, you know, the arrangement, he put, you know, put horns and strings on it, and the, the mix was great, and all of a sudden it gets to that part, and we're like, what the? <laughs> we were like freaking out, you know. You know what, yeah, I mean, what was what? You know, and we we played it again, and you know, we thought there was something wrong with the with the test press. You know? So it was it was his idea. It was our producer Jim Gersio's idea to put that psychedelic part at the you know well, he, before the end. He he had the Sergeant Pepper and thing stuck. I, th I think maybe a day a day in the life he was thinking of. I, I don't know what it was, but. I don't know, it, it, it wound up, a lot of radio stations would edit that out, you know. But then there's a, a time play, issue or whatever. It would go right from, the, yeah, right from the bridge, right to the love, love, love part, you know, and out, you know, and that's, but I mean. Wasted it, space. It was, it was still a big hit, we, you know, but the bottom line is, is that when I heard it, I was going, I was like, I, there's something wrong with this record player. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it made its debut, I, I mentioned it when we were playing on the Ed Sullivan show, we, we performed it. And then when it got to that section, we did this kind of a monkey thing. We, you know, it was a video with us running around and doing all this crazy stuff. And then, and then it would cut back again to the end of the. So when Sullivan so, they cut you know, to, the, to the record for now that. Now that I think the... about it, our producer didn't have an original bone in his body. Man. He was yeah. stealing from everybody. He was stealing from the Beatles. He was stealing from the monkeys. Well, it, well, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> So anyway, I'm gonna call that's, my that's, lawyer. That's how Susan. <laughs> not, not now, not a later. <laughs> so, oh, Charlie, were, were there yeah. any other ideas that came along that that then you said, "Oh no, we're gonna veto something from here on out," or what happened from that point? Uh, well, back in the day, you didn't have very much. Yeah, we didn't have control. control. And, you know, 
mean, first of all, people have to understand something. Carl was like, I'm sorry, I forgot about the mic. <laughs> this is what happens when you get old, see? Uh, you know, we were, we were like 19. <laughs> We were like 19 years old. We were like 19, 20 years old at the time. Carl was the youngest guy in the band. You were what, 18 at the time? Oh yeah, it was about 18. Well, at any case, and you know, we were brand new in the business, and then we were surrounded with people that had a lot of experience in the business. So, you know, Try we, 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 were like we, we were taking no, we were taking their advice because we thought that they were right, which they were all wrong, every one of them. You know. Well, we were taken advantage of with of course. publishing and writing. Song. Just like, no. No. Did you guys get ripped off in the music business? <laughs> oh. But this was on the cusp of. I of, don't believe. We didn't care. We just wanted to, you know, play our music, meet girls, you know, have a good time. We didn't think about things like publishing and our money, writing, money. Yeah. getting. Well, don't worry, we'll pay you. Okay, good. <laughs> Fact of the matter is, all of the '60s bands probably uh, that had more than like three or four hits. Got screwed. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, 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 most, and if they would have gotten every penny that they were deserved, you know, that they made, their, their children's children wouldn't have had to work today. You know, so it's like, it was a, it was a huge, huge amount of, of, of corruption going on back then. And, and, and our, our situation was we were ignorant to the, you know, to what was going on. So we weren't the only ones, the Beatles, they, they, they got raped. Don't worry, we're selling your record for a dollar. We're going to give you a half a penny, yeah, okay? That's good. Yeah. For each record. Think about how that'll add up, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, three cents on a record. I mean, two cents, whatever. Yep. So, uh, Mark, were there any situations like that in the Raiders uh, that uh, songs came in that weren't the way you wanted them, or there was a situation with the manager? Well, not not really. We we were lucky. Uh, we didn't have the the. The, well, we kind of had the drill bidding connection. You had Jerry Goffin and Carol King and all that group, and some of our songs came from uh, the other songwriting team, which is Bray Man and Cynthia Weil, who had a pretty good catalog as well. And after they wrote Kicks and Hungry, uh, I, I was living with Terry Melcher, and we're sitting down, and the last line in Hungry is, I'm hungry for those good, you know, hungry for those good things, baby. So Terry says, you know, Mark, I think we could write a, a hit song like this. And he said, what do you think we should do? I said, well, how about, hungry, how about Good Thing? Hungry for those good things. So we wrote Good Thing, and that was the first song that Terry and I collaborated on. And then uh, we were now writing songs like Ups and Downs, Him or Me, or whatever. And a song came in and sat on Terry's desk, and I didn't find out about it till later, but it was something called We Gotta Get Out of This Place. <laughs> Which, which I, I thought, that, I think the readers would have kicked the sh out of that song. But hey, but Eric did a real good job, you know? So, uh, so you can't win them all, but, but we were lucky. We had songs coming in and we were writing songs and I think like it's only fair that, that, that some credit is given to what used to be called A&R, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. One of the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, the Artist. demise of the uh, of, of the record industry, essentially, uh, there was this thing called A and R, and there were these people that did have their finger on the pulse, and there were these guys that we used to say they had golden ears. Donnie Kirshner was one. You, no matter what you want to say about the business part of it, and yeah, of course, we all got kind of ripped off, but there were these uh, this uh, record companies that did find some group in the middle of Kansas. And they used to travel around the, the country and they would go to clubs and they would go, you know, I think you guys might have something. Uh, we'll bring you back to LA. We'll support you. We will spend money. We'll get you an apartment. We'll t uh, you'll uh, come in, you'll rehearse. We'll bring you songs. We'll tell you how to dress. We'll do it was called A&R, Artists and Repertoire. And that did have a big, big influence because it gave guidance. It gave, especially you're 18 or 20 years old. And these guys, Clive Davis, you know. What a golden ears. Golden ears, talk about golden ears. Yeah. And there were others that said, this song and you, that's what uh, Clive did in 86 for the Monkees was with, that was in This Is Now. I didn't heard that song, no one. Vance Brescia was an unknown songwriter. And Clive is the one that said, that song, that group, let's do it. 
Um, so something must be said. There's some, there, there should be some credit given to those ANR people back in those days who did spend a lot of time and money finding a song here and a group here and a singer there and a thing there. Uh, and I just think that it, it's fair to give credit where credit is due. Well, well Terry Melcher, because at, at CBS, A&R then was Jack Gold, and he was a wonderful man, but he was tuned into Doris Day and, yeah, and the, uh, you know, a Thousand and One Strings or Mitch Miller and all that stuff. So he, there, nobody was actively finding songs for rock and roll groups, which were the first group signed to CBS. And Terry went out looking for songs, and he came back and says, Mark, he says, I found, I'm, I'm talk, Terry talked like that. So I'll talk like me. He says, I found this group at the Whiskey, they got a great song. And I told them if they'd let the Raiders have it, I'd send them on CBS. I'm going to go back tomorrow night and see if they're up for it. And of course it was the doors of the Light My Fire. <laughs> they told Terry, I think we're going to do this one ourselves. <laughs> so, Mickey, do you think that A&R, does it really exist today? Because, I mean, maybe in the case of like an American Idol, and then they take that person and they bring them through that system. Well, to some degree, I suppose. Those are talent shows, and the, the, it's great talent, talent scouts. scouts. And, and, and those are like, you know, uh, geez, uh, the Star Search it was the original uh, yeah. uh, Arthur Godfrey Idol. show. And before that, it was uh, Arthur, who was it? Arthur Godfrey. Arthur Godfrey. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, no, there's always been talent shows, and they're great. Oh, they're Hawaii. wonderful. But this is sort of this is sort of different. No, A and R does not exist for the most part. Is it just not financially viable anymore? Is well, no, because uh, since no that record company. idiot, that asshole that started Napster, uh, yeah. you know, now it's stolen. All the music is stolen. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and I've got to say, when when we get requests for for songs or whatever, people don't people don't. Maybe, maybe the, this generation understands by, about going down to the record store and getting that 45 with that big album and going, yeah. But you know, kids, kids today, <laughs> they, they think that since it's on, you know, YouTube, on Napster, whatever.